so we'll go ahead and get started on chapter 34. This is part two. This is more talking about the complications uh, that we can sometimes see with delivery, like breach and limb presentation and stuff like that, along with like neonatal care and APGAR scoring. And then there will be some review questions at the end. So we've talked about the beginning where we go through labor, but now what happens when uh, this is like post delivery, like after you've delivered the child. And so if the mother is able and willing, place the newborn on her abdomen. Usually it's the chest. Uh, so skin to skin can begin immediately. So there's this idea that when the mom's skin touches the, uh, or the baby's skin touches the mom's skin, it, it, it increases oxytocin. And oxytocin is this chemical that will increase uterine contractions even further. It also will allow milk let down to where they can begin lactation. Uh, and prolactin, you know, increases prolactin. And so anyways, the idea is you put the baby skin to skin with the mom also it keeps the baby kind of warm because mom's going to be warm um from delivering a baby and so uh it can help uh it helps with bonding there's a lot of benefits to skin to skin uh contact um with mom so you dry off the newborn and wrap him or her in a blanket or towel wrap the newborn so only the face is exposed remember babies cannot thermoregulate so they need to be wrapped um, um uh, pretty much everywhere but their face uh, because they, they'll lose heat. They can't shiver and stuff like that to, to stay warm, okay? And they've been cooking in a 98-degree oven for the last nine months, so as soon as they come out into the outside world, it's probably not 98 degrees, so they're going to be cold, okay? And so wipe the mouth with a sterile gauze pad as needed. You know, clamp the umbilical cord after approximately 60 seconds. And so, you know, baby will come out. You want to kind of keep it at, like, you wouldn't want to, like, raise it way up high in the air and stuff because the blood could theoretically drain out a little bit. And so the idea is you just kind of... uh like if this is the baby's umbilicus, you would take like a fist, right? Clamp, take another fist, clamp, and then cut, right? And so um, it, you would just make like a fist off on the baby's belly button and clamp right above your fist, and then you would make another clamp and then and then and then cut in between, okay? And so uh, you're gonna obtain the one minute Apgar score. This thing is important right here. Um, I'll we'll talk more about this, but what there's like a whole portion of this lecture today talking about this, but. This APGAR score is extremely annoying because what they'll do is they'll describe a scenario and you're going to have to calculate the score. So they'll be like, oh, the baby's cyanotic and the heart rate's 110 and, you know, the baby's crying vigorously and uh, the baby has, uh, you know, vigorous, you know, flexion and extinction or vigorous muscle tone and, you know, the respiratory and has a very strong cry, right? And so you'd have to figure out what that scoring is. And so we do this at two times mainly. We do it at one minute and at five minutes. So you don't do this the very second they're born. You wait 60 seconds, okay, and then you score them, okay? And so, you know, if the baby's pale, has a heart rate of 100, they're not crying, they're, they're not really moving, they're pretty flaccid, right? They're, they're probably in cardiac arrest. Like, they're, they're going to be in cardiac arrest if they're not already. And so, you know, that would mean you need to begin resuscitation. So we use this score clinically. And so um, um, th this is why... Uh, we do this at one minutes and five minutes is to, and to also determine like the score maybe right after birth. It wouldn't be uncommon. The maximum score is a 10. Um, it wouldn't be uncommon for someone to be born with like a seven, right? And then at five minutes, it's, it's a nine or 10 and that would be normal. Okay. So anything above a seven is normal. And then, so we use this clinically. And so I'll break down what these are in a future slide, like coming up, but the, we do the one minute after score the, a minute after birth. Okay. And so, Delivery of the placenta, so obviously we're just assisting with this. The placenta should deliver itself normally. It usually delivers within a few minutes after birth. It shouldn't take more than 30 minutes after the child has been born. But you never want to pull on the umbilical cord, as tempting as that may seem, because you got to deliver the placenta. It should be done on its own, so you shouldn't be yanking on that sucker. You can tear the cord, or, or you can cause hemorrhage as well. So don't do that. Do not yank on the cord. Now, if, if there's like bleeding... Um, like, like postpartum hemorrhage, you can do what's called a fundal massage. And the fundus is like the outgrown uterus, their belly kind of. And so what you can do is you can knead, like, like you're kneading bread, um, the, the fundus. And so you can kind of push on massage this. And the idea is this will help with delivery of, of the fundus or I'm sorry, the placenta. And so, um, just be aware that the, that's, that is a treatment that EMTs can do. Um, I've actually done this once on a lady um, that, that delivered a baby before we got there and she kept bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and so I ended up doing this on her. And so record the time uh, of birth in your patient care report. So this is pretty exciting. Some, a lot of times EMTs and paramedics get to sign the birth certificate 
because uh, you delivered the baby. So that's kind of cool. Uh, the following um, are emergency situations. So more than 30 minutes elapsed from the time the placenta from the time the baby's delivered and, and, and the placenta is not delivered in 30 minutes, that's an emergency, okay? So it should you should deliver the placenta within 30 minutes normally after the baby comes out. That's what's normal, okay? Now, this definition is important to know. If there's more than 500 milliliters of bleeding before delivery of the placenta, okay? And so that's quite a bit of blood, right? So it's going to be half of an Ambien water bottle. And so the idea is um, uh, if... That less than 500 would be kind of normal-ish, um, but when you exceed 500, they classify that as postpartum hemorrhage. And so this is where, you know, sometimes an OB doctor will have to go in there and, and, and cut off some vessels or, you know, they'll have to, or, you know, do a curatage or something. So they're going to have to do something to fix this because, uh, you know, again, the most common cause of death in, in pregnant women is the postpartum hemorrhage, okay? That's what kills them. And so um, if there's significant bleeding after delivery of the placenta, now keep in mind, there will be blood. There will be quite a bit of blood, actually, um, but you know, when, when it's more than half a liter of blood, that's when it's an emergency. So the first minute after birth is what we call the golden minute, and so during that, you know, this is where we're trying to open their way and suction if needed. Remember, we do the mouth and the nose. We're going to dry them. This drying also stimulates them because it's annoying to the baby, so it'll make them cry. Uh, we will warm them, okay? So we keep them uh, warm, wrapped in a blanket. Everything's wrapped except the face and tactile stimulation. If you don't know this, the best way to piss off a baby is to tap the bottom of their heels. Um, they, they hate it, okay? And so if you're ever trying to stimulate a baby, you know like in adults will do a sternum rub or something to that effect. Babies, you literally just have to tap on the bottom of their heel. They hate it. They'll go bonkers. They'll start crying or they should start crying. And so just keep that in mind. That's, that's the technique we use. And so Normally, the newborn will begin breathing within 30 seconds after birth. The heart rate should be above 100. Uh, so that's an important number to know that baby's heart rate should always be above 100. When it's less than 100, you really need to start worrying, okay? Now, if the baby is uh, not breathing, right, they're not really crying and really kind of making that respiratory effort, then we might need to use positive pressure ventilations and kind of help them out for a little bit. Um, now, if their heart rate drops less than 60, then we do full-blown CPR. We do ventilations and chest compressions but let's say a baby's breathing like four times a minute you know a minute after delivery they're breathing four times a minute they're cyanotic we're trying to stimulate them they're not really crying okay well at that point we're going to start ventilating and if their heart rate stays above 60 then we don't do cpr we don't do chest compressions uh many like i said many newborns will require some form of stimulation so just being exposed to the world is enough for some babies the more tranquil babies, it's going to take more. You're going to have to like dry them and rub them and stimulate them um, and maybe tap the bottom of their foot or verbal stimulation or whatever to try to wake them up, okay? So we've talked about that. Um, this is important. Perform chest compressions if there is no pulse or if the heart rate is less than 60 after 30 seconds of ventilation and the heart rate is not increasing. So again, baby comes out, heart rate's, you know, 80, that's bad. It should be above 100. You do 30 seconds of ventilations. You notice it's now 55 or 60 or whatever. Then you need to start full-blown CPR, chest compressions and ventilations, okay? So you don't have to wait for it to be zero like we do in adults to do CPR. Um, you just go full-blown CPR if it drops below 60. And let me, this is a very important concept to know. Why do babies die? Why do babies die? Why do babies die? Ask yourself, why would a baby die? It's from one cause and one cause alone. Hypoxia, right? So babies die from hypoxia. They don't die from cardiac arrhythmia. They don't die from neurological disorders. They don't die from metabolic disorders. That is exceptionally rare, less than 1%. Um, babies die from not enough oxygen. So what the idea of this is you're like, well, why would you ventilate a baby before starting CPR? For Why would you ventilate for 30 seconds? Because... Just the act of ventilating for 30 seconds is going to probably fix their hypoxia enough to where it's going to raise their heart rate and they won't die, right? They won't further progress into cardiac arrest. And so we very, very, very highly prioritize uh, ventilations in babies. This is why the algorithm's 15 compressions to two breaths in newborns or in children or in babies. Because, you know, instead of 30 to two like we would in an adult, 30 compressions to two ventilations in, in children, we're doing 15 compressions to two 
ventilations. And so we're like doubling the ventilatory rate because ventilation and, and respiratory uh, and, and avoiding hypoxia is that important for babies. So observe the newborn for spontaneous respiration, skin color, and movement of the extremities. Uh, evaluate the heart rate um, at the base of the umbilical cord or, or the brachial artery or by listening to the newborn's chest with a stethoscope. By the way, a regular adult stethoscope will work on a newborn. Everyone acts like you have to have a pediatric stethoscope. You're, you don't. So an adult stethoscope, you can listen to a baby's heart just fine. One. Two. What's the brachial artery? It's the one in right here. It's, if you were to dig and push towards your humerus between the bicep and the tricep, you that's where we – uh, check the, the heart rate on, on infants. And so we don't check the carotid pulse on infants. Why is that? Their neck's all soft and fragile. And so, again, do not check a carotid pulse in a baby. We check it at the brachial pulse. So, again, if chest compressions are, uh, are needed, I don't know about that, but... Perform bag mass ventilations during a uh, during a pause after every third compression using a ratio of three to one. I have never heard that. Okay, well, I guess watch out for that. I didn't know that. I don't think. Well, the AHA standard is fifteen to two. Okay, so I would probably go off of that. Anyways, you can do. Um, um, Hands only CPR is not going to be as effective as ventilation with CPR. Um, I would never do a mouth to uh, mouth on an adult ever, but on a baby, you know, if you're, I probably would actually, if I had to, like if I didn't have a BVM or something like that. Um, but remember, if you're going to do that, like a mouth to, if, if someone's going to do mouth to mouth on an infant, I'm not encouraging this. I'm just pointing out something. If you're going to do mouth to mouth on an infant, it's actually mouth to mouth to nose. So you actually put your whole mouth over the baby's mouth and nose. So meconium, remember meconium is that green stuff. It's when the baby pooped during delivery and they got in their amniotic fluid. And remember, babies are breathing in their amniotic fluid, which is normally just urine. And so that, um, if they breathe that in, it can cause respiratory problems down the road or even acutely. And so that's why we suction the mouth and then the nose after delivery, especially if there's meconium staining. So the, the standard scoring system, okay, so the APGAR score. And so this assesses five areas. And so, you know, we do this, remember, at one minute and five minutes after birth. A perfect score is 10, okay? And this is what it looks like. Uh, you must know this chart. I promise you'll get a question on this on your test. It's going to happen, okay? Um, and so, because we actually use this. And so, remember, uh, this is a little different than GCS that you can actually get a zero, okay? And so I just want to point that out. And so... Um, you know, what, what will happen on a test is they'll be like, oh, baby's got, you know, I need, I should screenshot this. Uh, baby's got, um, the, the, you know, they're, they're pink or they have acrocyanosis or let me, let me point one thing out. I'm kind of all over the place. This is called, it's a weird word that you could see on a test. It's called acrocyanosis, acrocyanosis. And so this is when the, the, uh, the mouth and the hands will be like blue, but the core will be more pink. Okay, so it's called acrocyanosis. You can see that on an exam if they're describing it. It's called acrocyanosis. But anyways, you would just use this chart um, to to uh, uh, test like like to, again to test you need to resuscitate. Generally, if it's less than three, you would do resuscitation. You know, seven plus is normal. Okay, and we do this at one and five minutes. So, um, so we calculate the APGAR stimulations result in immediate increase in respirations. Remember, just by drying them and rubbing them and maybe tapping their soles, that should stimulate them, okay? If the baby is breathing well, you would assess the pulse, assess oxygenation via pulse oximetry and observe for central cyanosis. Remember, um, if you have... Uh, cyanosis around the lips, mouth, and hands, we call that acrocyanosis. And it's a score of one on the APGAR score. And so, um, now this is a, an important concept. I've actually had this happen. I had a kid, die, a, a baby die. Uh, they were delivering the baby at home and they watched a YouTube video because they had a midwife but they couldn't afford it. So they watched a YouTube video and uh, it was like a nine hour delivery. 
And so the baby came out and was dead. And so, of course, you know, EMS got called. This is in New York County. And um, so as soon as we heard that, like, it's a delivery, the kid's not breathing, of course, we sent two ambulances because one ambulance is going to be very tied up taking care of, uh, of the baby, and the other ambulance is going to be tied up taking care of mom. Uh, in this particular scenario, though, I'll tell you, we ended up putting two crews in the one ambulance, and we transported mom in the back of the ambulance while we were trying to resuscitate the baby. The baby died. Um, but, you know, that that's an option, too. You just put more crews in the ambulance, so we put mom in the captain's seat, and uh, pff, that was a mistake. There was blood everywhere in meconium. And um, and so, anyways, I'm just letting you know, that's an option. And it was really kind of like a compassion thing, you know. I, we... If you're going to resuscitate a kid, generally it's – it's if the parents are being calm enough, you can allow them to watch. Um, it's part of like the grieving process and just letting the, – the, the data is – you know, the research and the experts will suggest that to where if you're going to resuscitate a, a child or even any family member, if the family can watch, wants to watch, and they're, they're not interfering, they should be allowed to watch. If they want to watch and they're not going to interfere, allow them to watch. Okay, don't force them to watch. It's very gruesome to do CPR uh, to the layperson. So, anyways, yeah, that kid died. Okay, it was very, uh, yeah. Okay, so, breach delivery. So, we know that normally a baby's head should pass through the birth canal and the vagina first. We want to see some hair when the kid's being born. But, unfortunately, these little rascals will spin around and do what's called a breach presentation. And so a breech presentation is where it's pretty much anything but the head is going to come out the vagina first. And so uh, this is bad because the, I, the, the reason the, is the head helps dilate this canal uh, a lot better than a butt would, right? And so – or a foot. And so uh, what, what can happen is the baby can get stuck in the birth canal, like literally stuck, and it can suffocate you know, or cut off the blood supply of the baby. It could tear the mom's vagina and their, and their uterus. You could invert the uterus. The uterus could rupture. There's a lot of issues that can happen with breech present delivery. So let me tell you this. If you're going to deliver a baby and you see hair sticking out of the vagina, excellent. It's going to be easy. If you're delivering a baby and you see a hand out of the vagina waving to you or a foot or a butt or something to that effect, a, a cord, uh, that's not good. That is not good uh, because typically there are – some maneuvers we'll talk about to try to overcome this, but by the time they're in the vagina, if you're seeing, you know, like a butt in the vagina, it's too late. You, you, you can't manipulate the kid very easily at this point. The baby's going to have to be either delivered, hopefully, or they're going to have to do an emergency C-section as soon as you get to the hospital. And so, anyways, bre this is called breach pe presentation. When it's the head, we call that vertex presentation, okay? And so... Um, these deliveries, like this says, are slow, so oftentimes you'll just have to transport them to the hospital, but uh, the, the problem is they're slow because the baby's stuck, not because they want to be slow. Um, so mom's body doesn't know, and so it'll be squeezing, squeezing, squeezing the uterus trying to deliver this baby, but it can't. So again, that's where you get these complications where you can get, you know, the, the baby can lose its uh, blood supply, the baby can get squished, you can break the baby's bones. You can tear mom's vaginas. I mean, or, there's a lot of problems that happen with, with breech delivery, okay? And so uh, uh, just be aware of that. And so this is like kind of showing you what – like this is, a, this, is, this is a breech delivery, right? And so, so if you see a foot sticking out or a hand – you know, I mean a hand's usually fine, but if you see a foot, uh, that, that is bad, right? Even a hand too, that's not great either, but a foot is probably more common. Uh, or this is called frank, uh, a frank delivery or frank presentation. And so this is where the butt will be sticking out first. So that's what I'm saying. When you see the butt sticking out of the vagina, that's bad. Uh, or a transverse slide, the mom will not be able to deliver the baby like this, okay? But mom's body doesn't know that. So it'll keep squeezing and squeezing and squeezing the uterus, and the uterus can actually rupture. It can, like, explode. It can tear um, if, if, if it keeps squeezing because it's not going to be able to squeeze a baby through, through the vagina sitting like that, okay? And so breech deliveries usually take longer, so you often have time to transport to the hospital. If the buttocks have passed through the vag vagina, the delivery has begun. So like I said, if you see a baby's butt in the like at the opening crowning from the vagina, um, that's bad, okay? And so uh, this is like a, a true emergency. You need to go to the closest hospital, and hopefully there's a doctor there who will do surgery to fix this. Um, and you might even call your medical director, and they may talk you through some more advanced techniques to uh, try to de deliver this baby. 
this is a breech presentation, right? The baby's butt came out first. The baby's head's still in the vagina. And so that is a, I mean, this is bad, okay? It's not ideal at all. And uh, so prepare for a breech delivery is the same for a normal child. You'll position the patient, open your OB kit, place yourself and your partner as you normally would. Allow the buttocks and legs to deliver spontaneously, supporting them with your hand. Now, I will say it is possible to deliver a breech baby without surgery. It's just going to take a lot longer, and there's a much, 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 much higher chance of complication than a normal delivery. So if uh, – and these take a while because it's coming – I mean, you're pushing a really big something through a pretty small hole that was not designed to deliver that way. It was to deliver for the head first. And so uh, this is going to take longer to deliver. And so what you can do is the head is almost always face down. It should be uh, allowed to deliver spontaneously. Remember, we never pull on a baby, right, decapitate them. But uh, you can make like a V with your glove finger. It's the, one of the very few times you can stick your fingers in the vagina as an EMT or a paramedic. You can make a V with your glove uh, fingers and position them in the vagina to keep the walls from comp compressing the fetus's airway. And so what you can do is you're kind of like opening up the vagina like this to, to keep it from pushing on the baby's airway. And so you're not like, I don't know how to describe that. You're, 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 you're pushing the vaginal walls off of the baby's neck in their face. And so that's one of the few times you can stick a glove finger in the vagina of a, of a patient as an EMT. And so this is called, like, again, a foot link presentation. You can see an arm or a shoulder or a, not shoulder would be rare, but an arm or a foot presentation. Uh, this is life threatening. And so, or a limb presentation. And so, uh, when you see this again, this is emergency, right? Like this is a very quickly go to the hospital because what's going to happen as the uterus starts pushing down, if this leg doesn't come with it, um, the baby's hips are going to go in opposite directions. Like one foot's going to be up, one foot's going to be down. So you can break bones. Um, and so that's the thing with a breech presentation too, and like shoulder dystocia and stuff like that with big babies, they can break their bones. Baby's bones are very soft. Their joints are very, um, flexible but you can still break bones this way and so a fetus with a limb presentation cannot be delivered in the field uh, generally you're going to have to use surgery like a c-section you're going to transport it immediately if the limb is protruding you're going to cover it with a sterile towel never try to push on it or pull on it we don't push stuff back in the vagina you know so place the patient on her back um, with her head down and the pelvis elevated so that would look like this Whoops. That's pretty exaggerated. This, the, this is mom, right? And they're laying on the stretcher. So you're basically putting in like, like Schindelenburg. And so you're, you're elevating their feet. Okay. And like here's the wheels of the stretcher. You know what I'm saying? So you're elevating their, their, their lower half. You're trying to use gravity from, from pushing that baby out. Because again, something's gonna th there's gonna be injury if if you if the mom tries to deliver the baby with like a limb presentation, someone's getting hurt. Now this is a a very bad scenario too. So I, I said, oh, we like it when we see hair, but it's not good when you see hair and the umbilical cord at the same time because what happens is that's called a prolapsed cord, and so the umbilical cord here's a placenta, right? Here's the umbilical cord. If it's protruding from this dilated cervix and baby starts being pushed down onto this opening, compressing the cord, this is baby's lifeline. So if you choke this off, the baby is no longer getting any type of oxygen or nutrition um, during the delivery process. So you can end up with like cerebral palsy and all these issues. Uh, you know, the baby could be born mental, you know, intellectually disabled and, or they could die. And so this is called a prolapsed cord. Um, this is a bad deal when this happens, and again, it's you, you need to take the patient to the hospital, okay? And this is what they're saying. The, the fetus's head will compress the cord and cut off circulation. Uh, so we don't push anything ever back into the vagina, right? So you don't push the cord back in the vagina, hoping if you can't see it, it's not there. Uh, insert the gloved hand into the vagina and push the fetus's head away from the umbilical cord. So the umbilical cord should normally be pulsating, right? You should, you'll feel it pulsating. And so... Um, the idea is uh, try to move it to where you feel it, pull, like move pressure off of the cord, right? However you got to do this to get the cord to pulsate again, okay? So the baby's going to get uh, nutrients again. Uh, place the pregnant woman supine with the foot of the cot raised higher than the head with her hips elevated or in the knee to chest position. The knee to chest position is where um, they lay on all fours almost like a dog. 
right? And so they would just bring their knees to their chest and transport rapidly. The reason you do the knee to chest position is the positioning could hopefully push pressure off of the, the vagina and cervix and, and push it back forward to where you're, you're not, the head's not pushing on the, the prolapsed umbilical cord. Okay, so this would be a scenario where you would use fingers, right? It's the, the two times you can stick the, the glove finger in the woman's vagina as an EMT is for a breech presentation. You make a V to pull uh, pressure off the baby's airway. And the other time is in a prolapsed cord. You can push uh, pressure off of the umbilical cord to allow circulation to the, through the umbilical cord. It's the only two times, okay? Test question. That's the only two times you can insert glove fingers in a woman's vagina as an EMT. Now, the spina bifida, one of the mini bifidas, um, it is, there's several types of this actually. And so uh, basically this is a defect in the neural tube. And so what happens is this is the spinal cord down here. And for, well, there's a reason, it usually, well, there's a reason this happens and there's a genetic factor is this will bulge out in the lumbar spine. And this is what it looks like. And these are baby, this is spina bifida. Uh, to where it's open, we call this a myelomeningocele, and this is just called a meningocele. See this big bump down here? That's spinal cord contents, okay? And so this is a closed spina bifida, this is an open spina bifida, okay? Both of these are problems, okay? So what you would do is you would cover the open area with the spinal cord with a moist, sterile dressing. Remember, this is part of their spinal cord, so we want to try to keep this clean and moist, okay? And maintain maintenance of body temperature is important when applying the moist dressings. Okay, so it's not like you have a microwave to heat up the fluid, but you wouldn't want to cool the baby off when applying a moist dressing to this area. Multiple gestations. So twins occur one in every 30 births. Fun fact, I have an identical twin. And so twins are smaller than single fetuses. The reason is there's not enough room in the uterus uh, to, for, for, for two. And so generally twins are smaller and or premature. Okay, and so like I was born at 33 weeks. Um, so babies are born early when there's multiple gestation, multiple, you know, multiple babies cooking in, in the womb. And so, um, you know, the, the, uh, about 10 minutes after the first birth contractions will begin again and the birth process will repeat itself. The second one is usually born within 45 minutes of the first. Okay. And so just be aware twins are a thing. They do exist. The, hopefully the mother knows if she has twins or not. So the procedure is the same as that for, uh, so with multiple gestations, the same for twins. Record the time of birth separately for each twin, okay? I was born a minute earlier than my brother, um, so I am his elder. And twins may be so small that they look premature. And they may, in fact, just be premature as well. But generally, even like a full-term twin, if they ever get that far, um, are pre or, or they're small babies. The other reason they're small babies is because they're sharing the nutrients with another baby. And so that's another reason that twins are small. Okay, and then so premature birth. So a, a normal full burns, full term, um, uh, single newborn will weigh about uh, seven pounds of birth. That so around seven pounds is what's normal. Okay, um, any newborn who is born before eight months, which is thirty six weeks, or weighs less than five pounds at birth is considered premature. So hopefully, if they have prenatal care, they know that their baby is is has is not growing fast enough, or, or even worse, sometimes if they grow too big, then you know you can't do a vaginal delivery. If it's like this big diabetic baby, so moms that have diabetes have really big babies, and so um, just be aware of that. Okay, and so they're, they're just showing you this is a, a twin right here, and this is a, a normal baby. Okay, this a, this or I'm sorry, this is a premature baby. I'm sorry, and this is a normal baby. But again, twins can be small like a premature one. Okay. A premature newborn is smaller and thinner, and the head is proportionally larger. Uh, the vernix uh, caseosa will be absent or minimal. Remember, this is like the wax-like stuff that, uh, that facilitates the delivery. And there will be uh, less body hair usually. And you can even see that here. This baby has more hair than this baby. Uh, premature newborns uh, require sp uh, special care to survive. So you the, these babies have to usually go to a NICU if they're less than 36 weeks, at least for a day or two, usually longer. And so, um, you know, that's something to consider. Does this hospital have NICU capabilities? Um, if you, I mean, if you have a choice, they're like right next to each other. One has a NICU, one doesn't. Obviously, go to the one with the NICU if you have a premature baby, okay? Uh, with such care, premature newborns as small as one pound. Remember, the average weight of a baby is seven pounds. 
but a baby as little as one pound have uh, survived and developed normally. Okay, so NICUs are actually pretty incredible places. Those are very specialized nurses and doctors, and so these babies can live um, if they get to the right care. Now, a postpartum pregnancy. So this is a pregnancy that lasts longer than forty-one weeks. Um, and, the, and the fetus can be large. Sometimes they'll weigh up to 10 pounds or more. And the problem with that is when they're really big, uh, like a big baby, again, like a baby that's been in, in the uterus for too long, cooking for too long, like at 41 weeks or more, um, they get really big. Or a mother who has diabetes that's not well controlled, the baby has lots of sugar, so they get really big. And so the problem with this is they'll get so big that the mom can't vaginally deliver them. So that's the problem here. And so... When they're really big like this, you, you increase the risk of damaging the mom and or the baby because of how big they are trying to push them through the birth canal. And so this is why typically uh, OB doctors will just elect to do a C-section on big babies. Okay, It's just because the risks are so high because you're probably going to tear the – you will tear the vagina in big babies for sure. And you may even tear, tear the perineum. You know, There's just a lot of risk. Okay, And so you could have postpartum bleeding, meconium staining, right? So just be aware, okay, the, if, if it's a big baby, mom tells you, oh, my baby's 11 pounds on my last sauna, holy cow, that's going to be tough. Um, they're probably going to have to do a C-section. Now, fetal demise. Um, you may deliver a fetus who died in the woman's uterus before labor, okay, and so this can happen, you know, at any point, at 16 weeks, 20 weeks, you know, generally I'll say past 20 weeks and about 500 grams, which is 0.5 kilograms. Um, that's a considered a viable baby, generally. Some will say 24 weeks, okay? But generally, somewhere between 20 and 24 weeks of gestation and around 500 grams is considered a viable baby. Now, these babies will die in, 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 the, in, the, in the uterus, and that's called a, a, a interuterine fetal, a fetal demise. And so what happens is uh, the, the mom's body will eventually realize, like, okay, we got we got to expel this, this dead baby, unfortunately. And so they'll go into labor, but um, uh, the, the and, and sometimes this can even be like very very infected as well. It's a dead human inside this lady's uterus, um, that, so they can be like rotten and stinky and black and like uh, like like necrotic black. And so it can be a really bad deal when this happens. And so that's why it will be the foul odor because of the infection. Um, so anyways, if they're like very dead, like stinky and black and you know, like necrotic and deformed. We don't do resuscitation. Now, if it's a viable baby, generally 20 to 24 weeks or greater than half a ki uh, kilogram, then yes, we do resuscitate those. Okay? So, oh, and, and do transport uh, the mom and, and the fetus, for that matter. A lot of times, again, they'll do a laboratory analysis of the fetus, figure out what went wrong, A, but B, make sure there's no retained parts uh, in, in the uterus. Because obviously, if there's a retained portion of a dead baby in a mom's uterus, she's going to continue to have infection. And so if bleeding continues after uh, delivery of the placenta continued, again, we do that a fundal massage. If they bleed for more than 30 minutes after the delivery of the baby and the, and the, and the uh, placenta has not delivered, um, check your technique and hand placing if the bleeding continues. Excessive bleeding is usually caused by the uterine muscles not fully contracting. So the uterus, after delivery, should contract really tight and almost like with by you know like we apply pressure to bleeding. Well, the uterus should do that to itself and, and control and clamp off its bleeding. That's what's supposed to happen. But sometimes, especially if it's been a very long delivery, you can get what's called uterine uh, atony and so or atony. And so basically, what will happen is the uterus is too weak to contract. And so this is one of the many causes of postpartum hemorrhage that, again, can be fatal. Very, very fatal. The postpartum hemorrhage is scary. So you don't want that. Like, that will kill mothers very, very quickly. Very quickly. So with postpartum hemorrhage, you want to cover, or, uh, cover the vagina with a sterile pad, and you're just going to put the pad over it. That's like a, pretty much like a gauze that would go on the outside of the vagina. Again, we don't put anything inside the vagina. Uh, do not discard any blood-soaked pads. They can use those as a calculation um, to figure out how much blood has been lost. I don't remember the number, but each pad holds like – I'm going to make up a number, like 100 milliliters of blood. It's more than that. But well, they'll use that like, oh, God, they soaked 10 pads in, ten, in, in an hour. You know, Then we use that clinically to estimate blood loss. So post postpartum patients are at an increase of, of an embolism. 
And so what's interesting is this embolism can be from blood, like a blood clot. That's what we typically speak think of. But they're at actually at a much, much higher risk of what's called an amniotic embolism. Okay, and so an amniotic embolism is where that amniotic fluid gets into the bait, it gets into the mom's circulation somehow and travels to the lungs or the heart. And so what you'll hear is they will get in it. Well, in this, this circuit, the, the amniotic stuff will, will trigger the clotting cascade as well. But the cause of this is the is amniotic fluid will enter the mom's bloodstream and cause these embolisms. And so and the amniotic fluid itself could be an embolism. But what I'm saying is um, if they tell you like, oh, mom, after delivery, two minutes after delivery, suddenly has very uh, – she has bad shortness of breath, chest pain, you know, clear lung sounds. You should think, oh, that sounds like a PE. Well, it probably is. So be careful for that on quizzes and exams. Moms who have severe shortness of breath and chest pain immediately after delivery, you should think, oh, that is a pulmonary embolism. That is very bad. Okay? How do we treat pulmonary embolisms? Oxygen. In a diesel bolus, they need to go to the hospital for blood thinners, and sometimes they'll go in there and grab that clot surgically. Now, let's do the review question that I did not I, – I keep saying, oh, I'm going to read them. I didn't read them. And OB is like my worst subject, so here we go. The first stage of labor uh, ends when – okay, so the three stages of labor, uh, the presenting part of the baby is visible. So the first stage is – so the first stage of labor starts when the cervix begins to dilate, and it ends when the baby's – a part of the baby starting to enter the birth canal. Yeah. Hey, boom. That one I'm pretty confident on. Yeah. Good. Booyah. 23-year-old woman who is 24 weeks pregnant with her first baby complains of edema to her hands, a headache, and visual disturbance. Sounds like preeclampsia. When you assess her vital signs, you note that her blood pressure is 160 over 94. Definitely preeclampsia. She is most likely experiencing preeclampsia. Now, what's the difference between preeclampsia and eclampsia? Eclampsia is the same story, but they have a seizure. Eclampsia literally means seizure in pregnant lady. Not literally, but that's what I want you to know. That's preeclampsia. Okay, this is a this is a life threatening emergency to the mom and the baby. And so, what you need to know is. Um, just watch for – this is like the classic example. This is a good question because it's the classic example of edema, which is swelling of the hands, a headache, and visual disturbances with high blood pressure. Oh, man, they're, hand, they're spoon feeding you. That's preeclampsia, okay? Now, if preeclampsia progresses to the baby or the mom having a seizure, then we call that eclampsia. You're transporting a woman who is eight months pregnant to dry, uh, to prevent supine hypotensive syndrome. How should you position the patient? On her left side. Remember, the inferior vena cava sits on the patient's right. And so what you want to do is roll the baby – or the mom – I keep saying baby – roll the mom on her left uh, to, to prevent that pressure of the big old baby from pushing on the inferior vena cava. So we're kind of using gravity to our, our advantage there. Immediately after delivery of the infant's head, you should. D. D. You do suction the baby's no, uh, mouth and then nose, but uh, let me put these in order for you. It would be one two, three, four. That's the actual order that we would do these. So you would make sure that the cords aren't wrapped around the neck. Okay. If it is, you slide the cord off the neck. We, when the, remember when the cords are wrapped around the neck, we call that a nuchal cord. And so you would want to slide the cord off the neck. If you can't slide it off, you cut the cord. Okay. Um, and then when the baby's fully delivered and they're going to start wah, wah, wah and crying, then you would suction the mouth, nose, and a minute later do your APGAR scoring. So uh, who wants to be a millionaire style D final answer? Boom. This is what happens. I get cocky, but then I start getting them wrong. So I need to cool it. Upon delivery of the baby's head, you note that the umbilical cord is wrapped around. I just said this wrapped around its neck. You should. Yeah, I just said this. 
make one attempt to slide the cord over the head. Yeah. You want to slide it. If you can slide the cord over, off of the baby's neck and across their head to unwrap it, then that's what you should do. Booyah. It's almost like I just finished my ob gun rotations for six weeks. All right. The need for an extent of newborn resuscitation is based on... Oh, gosh. This is a tricky one. The one-minute APGAR score is helpful, and we could use that. But it's not – You what about 10 minutes down the road? Do we just not resuscitate them, you know? So we don't only use the one-minute APGAR score. We definitely would use the respiratory effort, heart rate, and color – the one that throws me off, this is a close second for me, and I hope it's not the right answer, is the newborn's response to auction. Because remember, we'll ventilate the baby for like 30 seconds to see if we can get the heart rate up. Hope I don't get this wrong. D, final answer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's good rationale. Oh God, Afgar scoring. I should have. The one minute Afgar score of a newborn reveals that the baby has a heart rate of 90, a pink body, but blue hands and feet and rapid respiration. The baby cries when the soles of the heat are flicked and resists attempts to straighten its legs. You should. Oh gosh. Let me add this up in my head. Okay. So heart rate of, of, of that's going to be a one, one, two. Two, two. I think it's going to be an eight. They're even nice and put this in order for you. Well, it's not in perfect order, but remember, APGAR stands for appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and uh, respiration rate. And so I've been cocky today. I'm going to go with eight. I just calculated it. So that's two, four, six, seven, eight. Yeah, eight. Yes. Nailed it. Yeah, it's an eight. Okay. Do you know the APGAR scoring? It took me years to figure out. Okay. I did not know this in EMT or paramedic school. It's terrible. But these questions are kind of easy if you know how to use them. The most effective way to prevent cardiopulmonary arrest in a newborn is to... Oh. Ensure adequate oxygenation and ventilation. Final answer. We start CPR if it's less than 60. C, final answer. Okay. Make them harder. I'm ready. While assisting a woman in labor, you visualize her vaginal area and see an arm. Yikes, we call that a limb presentation. An arm protruding from her vagina. She tells you that she feels the urge to push. Oh, don't do that. Um, you should. Okay, good. We'll work our way backwards because wrong. We don't. Um, you wouldn't want her. To, you wouldn't want to encourage her to deliver because again, this is usually has to be fixed surgically. Wrong. Okay, we don't stick it. We don't do this. This is not a scenario where we stick our fingers in the vagina. When are the two scenarios we stick our fingers in the vagina? A breech presentation. Uh, to keep the vagina wall off of the baby's airway, and uh, also for a prolapse cord to remove pressure off of the cord from the vaginal walls. Um, encourage her to keep pushing as you prepare for rapid transport. No, you would rather this patient deliver in the hospital because it's probably going to be done surgically. So we would cover the arm with a sterile towel and transport. Good. This is almost has to be always fixed surgically. Or there's a few, I mean, OB doctors can do maneuvers to try to fix this, but we're not OB doctors, so. Okay, new, a newborn is considered to be term if it is born between. I, thought, I think it's going to be 37 to 42, but. I thought we called it post-term if it's over 41 weeks, but I don't see that as an option. 
Oh, jeez. Don't get the last one wrong. Um, I'm going to guess 37 to 42. Because less than 36 weeks is premature. B, 37, 42. Final answer. Yes. I got them all right today. Who would have thought on OB of all topics? I'm terrible at OB. Okay, good. All right. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Pediatrics is next.